free. And given our financial uh, constraints, we may wish to uh, charge a little fee for, for, for certain people. So you, 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 you compile that, you have them readily available for all who may be interested in reading your judgments. Two, you also have, maybe I should rush to court hearings. Most of the witnesses, whether it would be for a commission or whatever, most of the witnesses who are abroad, instead of paying as much money as we pay for them to travel at great inconvenience to them and accommodating them, they would be able to testify from where they are, even from within the country. All we have to do is satisfy ourselves that the person who's going to testify is the person whose testimony we're really interested in. They can be testifying from, from Polokwane and we are here. That system, we've seen it work in other jurisdictions, it works well. E-filing, these voluminous records um, can be phased out and people um, can simply access them, uh, file them and access them um, you know, um, um, on the, on, fr from the system. What we will still reserve room for paper because some people who may be in far removed uh, areas that are not as technologically advanced as uh, your towns and cities may still need that. When we visited uh, Malaysia, we realized that there is still room for a, for a minority of people who still need paper and so on and so on. So e-filing, court hearings, and... Um, and um, all documentation, we, we would want to see ourselves moving towards the stage where we are a paperless uh, court. And when that happens, you see the problem that we had here with our IT system would not have, uh, would not have had the profound negative effect that it had if we had moved into that space. Because what it requires is that you have your nerve center here but you also have your off-site nerve center. When this system collapses, you still have full access to all the information you need in relation to cases elsewhere. But that requires a, a full team of, uh, of technicians to attend to your system. Just to give you an example, when we visited the federal district court in, uh, of, of uh, Arizona in Phoenix, we, they had about 13, 13 highly qualified technicians just for that court. And that's, those are the capacities we need so that uh, we can run the system as efficiently as, uh, as possible. The technicians who will sh ensure that uh, the firewalls around our systems are as tight as can be. You know, I was talking to, to colleagues in China, uh, one of their, of their, I forgot the name of it, but that's where their technology really, really started at the highest level. They've got an, an e-code there. You remove the, the, the information from that system, the court collapses. I say, how do you get it right? How did you, what kind of firewalls did you build around uh, your, your nerve center? They said, we went all the way. It's virtually impossible to penetrate our, our system. Those are the kind of things we would want to build into our information system. Um, and then, this is the last one, um, in your forward, forward, you said that cases will have piled up as much as they have during lockdown. Obviously, the figures that are contained in this report only go up to March, so really they don't include, or they're not reflective sure. of, of the impact that sure. lockdown would have had on the judiciary or on the functioning. Um, how, it's quite speculative obviously, but how could we potentially expect to see the impact manifest in next year's report? What are some of the issues, or how has the backlog basically manifested, um, or, or how severe has the backlog been over the COVID period? Take it at the high court level, at the regional court level, and at the district court <laughs> level. During the, the lockdown, um, mm -hmm. uh, those courts could not run uh, as, as efficiently as they ought to remember. That's where most of the trials happen. Um, high courts have got to run trials, civil and criminal, they even have to do circuit courts. The inability to do so has had undesirable consequences. And the same extent, especially to the magistrate's court. It's, it, it's almost about trials there. And they have not been able to cope with the workload all along. 
Just imagine what the impact of the work law of the of the lockdown has been on the proper functioning of those uh, of those courts. So so uh, it, we, we 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 can only speculate we haven't looked into it we haven't compiled the report yet but i think uh, the picture is likely to be bleak thank you, thank you ma'am you, ma can i check with the colleagues online first i don't see any hand um, colleagues you'll indicate if you want to ask i don't want you to feel that you're not given a chance uh, but uh, we'll take your question i don't see any hands at this point Around some of the members of the judiciary who are facing charges, uh, such I'm as the uh, president Judge Prophet, and also the allegations around the relationship um, uh, that the uh, that the deputy chief justice officer seems to allegedly have had with the former president Jacob Zuma. What do you think these relationships? Um, what kind of impact do they have in terms of the no, 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 no. What kind of impact does what have? The alleged relationships or political relationships that uh, members of the judiciary seem to have uh, with some members in the political sphere. And I will have to be very clinical there. <clears throat> and, and maybe we must take it one by one. Let's deal with, uh, is it uh, Judge President Lope you want to start with or is it the Deputy Chief Justice you want to start with? And whoever you want to start with, point to the specific problem that you want me to comment on. I don't want to assume that I understand your question when in fact I don't, because I want to be direct in dealing with your question. Just start with a particular person and say uh, there is a perception that this is a problem, and then you ask your question. So in terms of the, uh, the uh, president's uh, the fact that he's facing charges, um, what kind of impact does that have on the credibility of the judiciary? That's my one question. My second question with regards to the re al al alleged relationship that the Deputy Ju Chief, uh, Chief Justice Zolo has uh, with President Zuma. How does that impact on the work of the judiciary? Okay. Let me start with a second question. I, I believe that whatever issue we raise in the public domain we must be raising it because there is reason to believe that there is some substance in that issue there is lack of clarity there is need to clarify what happened you had two versions the version of uh, president uh, jacob zuma and the version of uh, Deputy Chief Justice Zondo. And the last time I checked, the ruling by the Deputy Chief Justice is very likely to be a subject matter of litigation. Uh, rumor that emerged from uh, the hearing was that uh, a review is likely to be launched. And under those circumstances, it's most inappropriate for me as head of the judiciary to be commenting on a matter involving my deputy that still has to be pronounced upon. I know that uh, I can't sit on any matter involving the commission, that one and any other, including the one of the, of the summons, for instance, because I was, uh, I was very much at the center of the, of the constitution of that uh, commission because I had to identify the judge to preside over the commission so i think let's leave that <clears throat> to the court system to iron out for us but i don't think i don't think that the reputation or the credibility of the judiciary is affected in any way whatsoever by that incident i mean i'll give you an example last year at a briefing of this nature um, uh, on the occasion of presenting the annual judicial accountability report, there is an issue I dealt with. And somebody wrote an article saying the opposite of what I said. So Mr. Mube brought it to my attention. He said, but this person has misrepresented what you said. And he contacted the editor. And the, well, first the journalist, the, the journalist was fuming. 
Then he said, okay, maybe there will be some, uh, some, uh, a reasonable response from the journalist, the editor. The editor was just as unreasonable. And we knew, for reasons I, I won't go into, that uh, we can't refer the matter to the press ombuds, uh, ombuds person. So after some toing and froing with Mr. Mnube, and a, a, a somewhat a watered down apology and amended version came up, which still amounted to a misrepresentation, a deliberate misrepresentation of what I said. Now for somebody to come and say, you know, there is this thing between that journalist and uh, the chief justice, does this affect the reputation of the media? I think it's unfair. There's been incidents of journalists reported to have taken brown envelopes and all manner of uh, allegations. Did that ruin the reputation of the media? I don't think so. The public does not expect you to be perfect people because you are not. The public, the reasonable public, that is, those that, don't, that do not distort things, do not expect the judiciary to be perfect. They know we are not. So it's inevitable that people will lodge complaints against the judiciary. I'll give you an example. There is a person who goes under the name of uh, Mwepe. I forgot the first name. And I don't know if it is one person. I don't know if it's a man or a woman. I don't know if it's a group of people using a wrong name. That Mwepe from time to time, and people don't think really, those that comment on this thing and get taken up by it. Sometime last year he lied and said he sent some, he or she sent something to me about corruption uh, in the judiciary in the free state. I addressed that during the judicial accountability report. He said, it's a lie. He never sent anything to me. And two, I'm not the one who deals with those things. This is the Judicial uh, Conduct Committee. And two, to the extent that it amounts to corruption, he must go to the police. I'm not a police person. This year, the person circulated the thing again. And I'm told that the thing went wild. I say, you see, now our people don't reflect. They think it's a new thing. They have forgotten that this person circulated the same thing last year. Now, are you going to say that the reputation of the judiciary is under threat because Mwepe says that he reported corruption to me about five judges in the free state and I did not do anything about it? So, the matter is in the hands of the, of, the, of the courts from what I understand or is going to be placed in the hands of the court. I don't think the integrity of the judiciary or the reputation of the judiciary is before the eyes of all well-meaning and right-thinking South Africans. I don't think it's compromised in any manner whatsoever. Turning back to Judge President Thorpe, I don't think, broadly speaking, the mere fact that allegations against him have been made is here or there. You see, we've been saying to the public, as Chief Justice, I don't have the power to interfere. And I don't. If people want me to have the power, they must speak to Parliament to amend the Constitution and to amend the Judicial uh, Service uh, Act to give the Chief Justice the power, or the Superior Courts Act, to give the Chief Justice the power to intervene when there are allegations in any court. I don't have that power. And I'm not going to just to try and look powerful and responsive. Exercise the power that I don't have because it's against the doctrine of legality. So we should be pleased that the South African public, though the matter took long to be finalized, we should be pleased that the Judicial Conduct Tribunal set, judges testified, judge president testified, we are being held accountable as judges, the public would, be, would have been uh, uh, en uh, uh, um, entitled to be worried had the matter been swept under the carpet. It was never swept under the carpet. It's out in the open. It took as long as, um, as the Judge Motata matter. It took as long as the Judges Preller and, uh, and Poswa and others matters. Those are the exceptions. Only three matters. The many matters that have been referred to the Judicial Service Commission were almost promptly finalized. So it doesn't affect the reputation of the judiciary at all. It's a concern. I'm concerned when uh, things like this crop up. The question is, is the allegation well-founded? If it is well-founded, then the consequences will deal with whatever reputational damage is damage would otherwise have eventuated.
Yeah, we follow up, okay. Yes. Well, uh, you know, every South Africa, this is a democratic country. I didn't even see that statement because, as I said, I don't pay much attention to media reports. I, I think it's proper. Any South African who feels aggrieved by what any judge, any magistrate says, including me, they must lay complaints. Whether the complaints are well-founded or not is a matter that will be decided by the relevant structures. So think about it this way. <clears throat> Some member of the public or members of the public may hate me so much that they are always looking for an opportunity to run me down. They are entitled. They are not under an obligation to love me. They are entitled to say, you know, how can we deal with this man? Let's, uh, let's just report him so that at least maybe when the cases pile up, the public may begin to see him as this irresponsible person who was mistakenly appointed to the position of chief judge. They are entitled to take their chances. So I'll wait for the complaint to come, and I'll deal with it when it comes. Uh, chief Justice, if I can just quote from that statement, they say that the Chief Justice is again failing to uphold the integrity of the office and the position he holds by turning certain vaccines as triple six or the labels vaccines. He is undermining not only the medical science, but also contradicting our government's position on vaccines. <laughs> well, one, I'm entitled to contradict anybody. Why am I not entitled to contradict government? Why? What is it there? What is there to say I must agree with everything that Parliament or the executive does? Where is it written? People lack understanding. They are desperate for nothing. <clears throat> so they can write whatever they want to write. They have the freedom to do that. It is their right. And people should not look negatively at these people. No. They can pile up as many complaints as they want. It is their right. So I'm not bothered by what uh, they and other people may choose to do about me. But that won't stop me from speaking. No. Whenever I feel that I need to speak, I will speak. I won't seek permission from anybody. It's a free country, this one. And then, that's oh. finally from my side. Oh, okay. No, it's fine. Uh, with regards to the vaccine again, uh, now the perception of the is that maybe you might possibly be against any form of vaccination and everything. <laughs> but the question now is, have you ever in your life been vaccinated? Like, as with what? For when what? You, when, you, when you were born and vaccinated against polio. And when I was born, I wasn't uh, old enough to see. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, the argument is you might be against because maybe you've never, you don't see a need or maybe you've never been vaccinated. But where do they get it from? You know, there is a problem with reporting now. I've seen it in this country. It's actually crazy. Uh, some people don't care about what you say. They care about sensationalizing what you, what you have said, developing a narrative that is not a true reflection of what you have said. So they can extrapolate something and popularize it. Before you know it, there is no correlation between what you actually said and what is being reported on and what is trending. So why did I say I'm against vaccination? Where? That is the problem with South Africa and the reporting. Where is it? So there is, there is, I don't know whether it is the laziness to think or a determination to push a particular agenda against some of us. I don't understand. Where did I say that? Where does it come from? So I'm not against vaccination. No. But any vaccination that will do harm to people, I'm praying against it, and I'll never stop. I'm asking anybody who cares about life to pray against it, not to campaign in the streets about it, because you don't know whether it is good or bad. I don't know. They may all be excellent vaccinations. I don't know. But I'm saying, in case there is a wrong one, uh, that one must not see any light of day. And if anybody now want to say no vaccination must never be prayed against, I must now be reported to the Judicial Service Commission for praying. It's no longer prayer, it's a political statement disguised as prayer. Let them go ahead and let's see what is going to happen.
So all these people, they must know. I'm not, they can even file as many complaints in their numbers. I'll never stop speaking whenever I feel the need to speak. We've been uh, silenced for far too long. I'm not one of those. Uh, I don't see hands uh, uh, on the other side to the colleagues online. And I don't see any... I think you have exhausted all the questions you had. By all means. Yes, ma'am. Let me know your name. My name is Komoto Yes, ma'am. I just want to speak about your emphasis on the independence of the judiciary. Yes. If you are satisfied with how things happen. No, I'm not satisfied with the institutional independence of the judiciary. Um, I, I think the Office of the Chief Justice as a national department must, by statute, be rendered fully independent of the executive, uh, the SG must not account to the judiciary partially and partially to the executive via the Minister of Justice and Correctional uh, Services. We are an arm of the state. And if uh, municipalities have uh, institutional independence as well as Chapter 9 institutions, it undermines the independence we deserve to have as the judiciary to have the administrative responsibilities that pertain to the judiciary um, um, still uh, uh, shouldered by, by the executive to the point where the Secretary General is appointed by the executive as well as the uh, Deputy Directors General. It is not right. Um, uh, uh, the kind of independence that, for instance, recently I had my colleague uh, uh, Judge President Bernard Mwepe in his capacity as the tax ombud, articulating the need for his office to be independent from SARS. That's the kind of independent that independence, administrative or structural independence that you need in relation to um, uh, functions that are intimate to the running of the courts. So I'm satisfied that judges are able to produce judgments, have that space available to them to produce judgments without um, undue interference. If any judge, any magistrate is interfered with, it can only be with his or her permission. That one is well secured. It is the administrative independ or institutional independence that I'm worried about. Are we good? Okay. Thank you very much, colleagues. I don't see hands of justice here. I think they are also satisfied. We should be done. Oh, okay. Thank you, good people. Uh, stay safe, and may we see you next year. Hey, this thing is there.